So somebody told me that you have a class up to yes. one. Yes. So everybody has come now. So we are starting that class. So recording the step two. Actually, regarding the recording of the earlier class, somebody requested me repeatedly to send him the to to send you the recordings. I'm not doing it right now because I'd like to have some editing on that because sometimes we talk also apart from the class. So I'd like to identify those parts and delete it and then send you the edited part. Okay. For that, just waiting, and meantime, I can give the uh, handout type of thing that I have prepared in the last class. I'll try to give it to you in 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 the meantime. Okay, sir. Now, we had been discussing the different mechanisms of heat transfer for the last two classes. I'd like to finish it within a short time, then we'll go for the actual classes. Now, when we discussed about these different mechanisms, we have so far discussed about conduction and convection. And we have said that in conduction, the heat flux is governed by the Fourier's law of this form minus q equal to minus k the conductivity into dt dx or delta del x depending on the situation that if t is a function of x only then it will be dt dx the temperature gradient and if t is a function of apart from x if t is a function of any other independent variable like y z time then this dt dx should not be the term it will be delta del x for finding out the heat flux along the x direction and there also if k is a isot if the material is an isotropic isotropic material then in the conductivity will be independent of the <coughs> direction then we can have in direction independent conductivity given by minus given by k whereas or other than isotropic materials which may be anisotropic there it may be direction dependent like kx ky kz so to find out the heat flux along x we can write qx equal to minus kx into delta del x, where qx is the heat flux along the x direction. Similarly, qy, qz, we can find out. Now, this k, even if it is isotropic, that is, if even if the k is direction independent, sometimes the k may have. conductivity may change from point to point. So K may be constant for homogeneous substances. K may be variable along X, Y, Z if it is a non-homogeneous substances. Even for a homogeneous substance where, as I said, K is supposed to be same so long as the temperature is same all through. But when we talk of heat transfer, that means there is a temperature gradient. And whenever there is a temperature gradient, that means at different points you have different temperature, there the conductivity may be may vary because of temperature variation. Because conductivity is a property that is dependent on temperature. Because if you see for a for a solid substance, the handover of the heat from one particle to next particle that is through continuous collision between particles and also that is because of other things also the electronic movement also may be there now all these things the movement of the electronic particles or the collision they will change as soon as the temperature changes so with a higher temperature sometimes the collision may be more higher so that it can have it can have higher conductivity. Sometimes a streamlined motion of electronic movement can get chaotic because of high temperature. In that case, K may reduce. 
So K may increase or decrease with temperature. So conductivity of a material may be temperature dependent. But within a certain substance, if you see the range of temperature that varies over the entire volume of the material, sometimes the temperature variation may not be much within a small space. In that case, because the temperature does not change much, so we can expect that the conductivity also will not change much. In that case, to make the thing simplified, we can assume a, an average or constant value of conductivity over the domain of our interest. Only when the temperature range varies appreciably, then only we have to be careful about a variation of conductivity over the domain where the temperature ranges over a large temperature difference. So otherwise, if the temperature range is not much, suppose the temperature varies within a range of 25 degrees centigrade, 30 degrees centigrade, there the conductivity may not be much different from one point to another point. So there is no need for considering a variable conductivity unnecessarily without helping us to improve the end calculation, but making the things unnecessarily complicated. So in those type of situation, where the temperature range is limited, the conductivity variation may be negligible. So we can take in those cases as constant conductivity, which is independent of temperature. But if the temperature varies too much, then we may require to be serious about thinking whether we should take a variable conductivity, a temperature dependent conductivity, or you should take a constant conductivity. So these are the complexities we require to consider. But even if we take a com complex case or a simplified case to find out the heat conduction flux, heat, heat flux, we require to know what is the temperature gradient. Now, how do we know the temperature gradient? That is by knowing how the temperature varies along with x, y, z, and time then only we will be able to find out the temperature gradient at a particular location. Wherever we find out the heat flux, we should calculate the temperature gradient at that point. <coughs> Sorry. So to know the temperature gradient, we must have a knowledge about how T varies with X, Y, Z and time. Then only we will be able to calculate the temperature gradient and thereafter we will be able to find out the heat flux. Now, when we talk of the convective part, now in convection type of problem, we have a maybe we have a heated plate whose temperature is known which wall temperature is known as Tw. And maybe in contact with that, a fluid is moving whose free steam temperature is T ambient. And we are accustomed to find out the heat flux due to convection as equal to delta T, the temperature difference between the surface and the free steam value multiplied coefficient of heat transfer. Now, if you know the coefficient of heat transfer, then we can find out, we can calculate the convective heat flux very easily. And if this is not constant over the entire surface, to find out the heat transfer rate from the entire surface, we require to integrate this heat flux over the area, or if the heat flux is independent of the area or constant throughout the area, then the heat transfer rate will be simply this heat flux into the total area which we want to consider. Now, all these are very simple if we know the value of H, but because other things are very simple to measure, we can measure the wall temperature from where the heat is being dissipated. We can measure the free steam temperature of the fluid. How do we measure the free steam temperature? That we can take a temperature sensing device like a thermocouple and can move away that thermocouple from a region very close to the wall and away from the wall. And as approach that we can take a thermocouple and we can move from a point that is very close to the wall and we can move away. 
from the wall and as we move away from the wall for a fluid that is heated and a wall that is colder then we can expect that as we move away from the wall we the temperature that will be recorded on the thermocouple it will be it will be recording a higher and higher temperature as we move away from the cold wall so what we can observe is that be it a hot wall or a cold wall near to the wall as we move away we will see that the temperature is changing the recorded temperature is changing as you move away from the wall but after a certain distance away from the wall you'll see that the recorded temperature of the thermocouple do not change any further that recorded temperature remains constant it shows a constant temperature and the distance from the wall up to the point beyond which the temperature do, does not change that distance is called the thermal boundary layer thickness the thickness beyond which the temperature does not change and the temperature within which uh, the thickness within which the temperature changes that is called the, the region that region from the wall up to that point where there is a variation of temperature that you can observe that region is called a thermal boundary layer region and the distance from the wall up to the edge of the thermal boundary layer that is called the thickness of the thermal boundary layer and beyond that we do not see any change that is why it is called a free stream temperature where the stream is unaffected by the presence of the wall and that free stream temperature you can measure with the help of a thermocouple where there is no change in temperature let us say that is equal to t infinity because it is substantially away from the wall and the wall temperature you can measure with the help of some device again maybe a thermocouple if you fix up the thermocouple on the wall though there also there may be some amount of error because if we fix up a thermocouple on the wall some part of the thermocouple bead will be touching the wall some part of the thermocouple will be touched by the moving fluid so the thermocouple bead will show us an average temperature of the wall and the fluid so there are many techniques to minimize this error so that we can sufficiently accurately measure the temperature of the wall so that is not a very complex thing to do we can measure the wall temperature we can measure the free stream temperature now knowing these two values we can find out the heat flux very easily if somebody tells us what is the value of h but if no such information is available regarding the value of h then it becomes it becomes difficult for us to find out the heat flux now to find out the heat flux there are two approaches you can follow whether it is conduction or convection or any other mechanism or combined mechanism of heat transfer we can have two approaches to measure this heat flux one approach can be an experimental approach where we can try to find out the heat flux with the help of some kind of an indirect device by which we can measure the heat flux now that device again is a very complex device and may be also prone to errors so experimentally we can find out the heat flux there may be another way to do is by a theoretical approach in the theoretical approach we can find the find out the heat flux if we know the value of h it becomes very easy but question is how do you know the value of h if the situation is a very standard situation we can see the value of h uh, from some kind of a chart or some kind of a table or some kind of a reference handbook formula correlation all these things but sometime the situation may not be a standard one it may be other than standard situation in which we have to know the value of h now question is how do you know the value of h or if our job is to find out the value of h because our job may be to find out the value of h and the value of h that we predict based on that another person will be calculating the heat flux my primary job is to find out the value of h in fact based on this requirement the whole subject of convective heat transfer has developed 
it is not one person, two persons are walking in the area of convective transfer. Hundreds of people are walking throughout the year, everywhere throughout the world to find out the value of age for different typical situation. And the number of people who are working in this area, they may be possibly a large number of people who are working, dealing with many different situations. Because depending on different situation, the value of each will change. But whatever may be the specific situation, there is a general approach to it. How do people find out the value of age? Theoretically, I am talking of. One can measure the heat flux, one can measure wall temperature, one can measure free steam temperature, then H may be found out as equal to measured heat flux by delta T. So that is one way. But if the situation is not so simple, then how to find out the value of H? In fact, in our laboratory, we have a setup for finding out the value of H for a somewhat simplified situation. And the value of H that we find out, that is also somewhat you can say accurate but may not be a highly accurate kind of situation now if you want to find out the value of age for a very complex situation and requiring a high degree of accuracy then we may go for as i said always we have two approaches one approach can be through experimental methods another approach can be through theoretical approach now experimental approaches are generally very time consuming very tricky and also expensive it requires a lot of sophisticated instruments sometimes maybe comparatively easier thing can be if we can follow a theoretical approach because to approach to a theoretical means what we require is a trend trained person and nothing else if one has some knowledge not some knowledge if one has in-depth knowledge about similar type of situation one can find out the value of age theoretically without taking help of sophisticated instruments not requiring so much of time to buy those things to apply those things to measure it correctly all these things are there but if we go through theoretical means what we require is a human mind who can find out and that human mind who finds out the value of age they follow a common approach the common approach is again like this as i have discussed what he does is that even though there is a convective heat transfer that people are studying what they assume in most of the cases is that the h value is something or the convection is something that occurs at the interface of a solid and a fluid in contact so <clears throat> the fluid which is in contact or the fluid which is in the near vicinity of the wall this is moving and when this is moving although the fluid as a whole is moving but we know from the due to the property of viscosity there will be one layer of fluid that may stick on the wall because of and that is that type of condition we call it as a no slip condition so we assume assuming that the fluid is having a no slip condition that is on the wall then the way by which the heat is transferred from the wall to the moving free steam of the fluid via this no slip fluid is by conduction the fluid which is sticking on the wall which is not moving the only way the heat is transferred from the wall to the next layer of the fluid which is moving via the non-moving fluid via the static fluid is by conduction so again we can apply the Fourier's law of heat conduction to, at that point as equal to the heat flux will be equal to minus k of the fluid k into del t del y we are indicating the direction normal to the surface as y and that the, along the surface we indicate is suppose x so we require to measure the gradient along y that is normal to the surface to find out the heat loss from the surface to the fluid in the direction to the normal direction of the normal to the surface so we require to find out the temperature gradient and we require to evaluate that y is equal to zero plus now so what we can find out equating these two we can find out h will be equal to minus k into del t del y at y equal to zero plus 
my divide by t wall and what is this t wall that may be known or maybe that if we know how the temperature varies along y then t wall is nothing but equal to t at y equal to 0 so if we know an expression for t, how t changes with y <coughs> then we can find out the temperature gradient along y if we know how t varies along y <coughs> excuse me now if we know how t varies along y then we can evaluate the temperature gradient along y at y equal to 0 plus and also if you know how t varies along y we can find out the t wall as equal to t at y is equal to 0. maybe that may be necessary to find out separately t wall or in some case maybe t wall is given or measurable so either way if we want to find out this h we can found, find this out in a different way theoretically if you know the temperature gradient normal to the surface and if you know the wall temperature if you know the free steam temperature then through this we can find out the value of h now the question is how do you know this thing how do you know this thing these are the matter of this subject that that is convective heat transfer how do you know this thing to know this thing we require to know how t varies along y and also we require to know how t varies along x y z and time because if t is only changing with y then we can expect that h will be constant along x and z because if t is changing only along y then once we find out delta del y and evaluate this at y equal to zero this becomes a constant but t may be a function of x y z and time in that case even if we evaluate delta del y at a particular x y this delta del y will be specific to that x y sorry it will be specific to that x and z and time and what we are evaluating is delta del y at y equal to zero so it becomes independent of y it becomes fixed at y equal to zero but it may change with x it may change with z it may change with time so this x we, if we find out this thing this x may be constant when it will be constant when t is only a function of y but it will be a function of x z and time if t if t is changing with x y z and time so this is how we find out the value of h that will be constant along x and z and time that will be a variable one so be it variable or constant the only way we can find out h theoretically is if we know the temperature gradient and if we know the wall temperature and the free steam temperature now to know this temperature gradient we require to know how t varies with x y and z and time so if we see the conductive heat transfer there also we require to know the temperature gradient for that also we require to know how t varies with x y z and time In convective heat transfer also we require to know how t varies with x y z and time then only we will be able to evaluate the value of heat flux in conduction and then only we will be able to value find out the value of h and then we can find out the heat flux for convection so be it conduction or convection we require to know how t varies with x y z and time then only we will be able to evaluate the heat flux due to conduction or heat flux due to convection so what we will be requiring to do is to find out a means how to find out t variation of t with x y z and time and for the time being i will be skipping the discussion on radiative heat transfer in radiative heat transfer it is an exchange between two surfaces that will deal with at a later stage but let us begin how we find out t as a function of x y z then only we'll be able to find out the conductive heat flux then only we'll be able to find out the convective heat flux so first we'll start with problems in conduction where we require to find out a function that will dictate how t varies with x y z because once we know that thing then only we'll be able to find out the temperature gradient and then only we'll be able to find out the 
heat flux along xyz similarly for convection also we require to know how t varies in xyz so mostly in conduction and convection if you go through a theoretical approach first of all we have to find out how t varies with xyz and time so how it varies how to calculate those things now we'll go into that discussion taking help of first the conductive heat transfer mechanism Now, how T will vary in conductive uh, in the field of conductive heat, conductive heat transfer? How T will vary is it depends on a equation that is known as the Govan equation. The equation that governs how T varies along x, y, z, and that is something that is a differential equation. And by integrating that differential equation, we can find out the temperature variation along x and y and z. Now, here what we'll do is that first we'll try to show you how that equation that dictates the variation of temperature, how that equation is formulated. We'll first discuss about that thing, then we'll discuss about what is the different what are the different forms of that equation can assume, and then we'll take up simplified cases to get a solution for temperature variation. Now the equation that governs this mechanism of heat conduction that is the first we'll try to show how it is being derived for that what we do is that within the domain in which the conduction phenomenon is taking place within that domain we identify a small volume known as a control volume now this volume may have a dimension given by delta x along x delta y along y and delta z along z so that we consider a cubical area having a dimension of delta x delta y and delta z and try to identify what are the different energies that the particularly the heat energy that crosses these boundaries it, this is this volume is bounded by six surfaces and as you know the heat transfer mechanism is identified at the surface of a system or a control volume or a control mass sorry in this case it is a control mass that has a dimension of delta x delta y and delta z and this volume is bounded by six such rectangular surfaces now the surface at at the back that is the heat transfer that takes place at the through the back we identify that as q dot x q dot this dot stands for the rate of heat transfer at a surface whose coordinate is a fixed x and the surface has a variable y and variable z but the surface has a fixed value of x and through that surface a rate of heat transfer takes place given by q dot x opposite to the surface that is at a distance of q that is at a distance of x plus delta x if this surface is situated at a distance of x then because this is equal to delta x so this surface has a coordinate of x plus delta x and then y varies over the z varies but the x coordinate of this surface is fixed at x plus delta x and the rate of heat that is leaving out of this volume is given by q dot x plus delta x so there is a certain rate of heat that is entering into the control volume given by q dot x and the rate of heat that is leaving this control volume is given by q dot at x plus delta x similarly this face has a fixed value of y at a distance of y from the origin and the rate that the rate of heat that is entering is q dot y and through the opposite face 
it is leaving this control volume and the rate is given by q dot at y plus delta y because this entire opposite phase has a fixed value of y plus delta y so this phase we can call it as the phase at y plus delta y this is the phase at y so through the phase at y let us assume that some heat is entering the rate of heat entering this volume is given by q dot y and the rate of heat that is leaving this control volume is given by q dot at y plus delta y similarly through the bottom phase of this cubical volume a rate of heat is entering that is given by q dot at z this phase the bottom phase has a fixed z and opposite to that the upper phase in the coordinate of this is given by at z plus delta z because if this is at a distance of z then this height is equal to delta z so this has a coordinate of z plus delta z so the rate of heat that is leaving the top surface through the top surface is given by q dot at z plus delta z so these are the six rate of heat conduction that are crossing this control volume out of which we assume that through three phases at q dot x at q dot y and at q dot z the heats are entering by conduction and at q dot x plus delta x q dot y plus delta y and q dot at z plus delta z these are the heats leaving this control volume now why one may argue why it is entering through this and why it is leaving through this if the choice is just arbitrary and when you assume that it is entering through this space and leaving through this space it, it 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 implies that possibly there is a temperature gradient a decreasing temperature gradient from if we move from this phase towards this phase if we move from the back phase towards the front phase we can if, if there is a temperature decreasing temperature along this direction as we move from the back side to the front side if the temperature is decreasing because of any external reason then we can expect that the heat will flow inflow from the outside to the volume and heat will come out from the volume to the outside because there is a progressive and gradual temperature decrement in this along x if it is then the heat will flow along x so that it will enter into the control volume at q dot x it will be leaving at q dot x, x plus delta x similarly if the temperature is gradually decreasing along y then you can expect a flow of heat in the direction shown on similarly if z is along z along increasing z if the te temperature is decreasing then you can expect that the heat will flow along the positive direction of z it will flow at a direction in a direction where the temperature is decreasing so the way we have shown that heat is moving in the positive y direction in the positive x direction in the positive z direction that means along x increasing x the temperature is decreasing along increasing value of y the temperature is decreasing along increasing value of z the temperature is decreasing that's why the heat will flow along that if the temperature decrement that we have assumed along increasing value of x if it is just the opposite that if the along increasing value of x if the temperature increases then we can expect the heat will flow in the negative direction of x similarly if the temperature does not fall along increasing y but if the temperature increases along increasing y then the heat will flow in the reverse direction of y it will flow in the negative direction it may flow in the negative direction of x and similarly if the temperature is increasing along z increasing value of z it will flow from the increased value of temperature towards the lower value of temperature so if t is higher at a higher z then it will flow towards the negative direction that is the thing so it is all a matter of assumption but the actual thing whether it is increasing along x or decreasing along x that will be ultimately determined by the surrounding situation but it has a name that will come to in a short while from now
Now these are the heat that are crossing the boundaries. Apart from these, there may be a situation or there may be situations where there may be generation of heat intern internal to the volume. For example, suppose this is a uh, this is a mass that is going through some kind of a chemical reaction. And as you know, in chemical reaction, the heat may evolve out because of that reaction or certain reactions, they may absorb heat. So in chemical reactions where there is a evolution of heat, the, we call them as exothermic reaction. There may be some chemical reaction where it requires absorption of heat. Those reactions, they are known as endothermic reaction. So if there is an exothermic reaction, it may generate some heat. So this volume, if it is going through some kind of a chemical reaction, it may generate some heat or it may absorb some heat. Just wait for one minute, somebody has come. Now, <clears throat> there may be certain cases where there may be evolution of energy, like maybe through chemical reaction, or there may be absorption of energy, again, through endothermic reaction. There may be other reasons also for evolution of energy or absorption of energy. For example, if it is a, a conductor is there, and through that current is flowing, then because of the resistivity of that conductor, it may be generated, ohmic heat may be generated. So whenever there is an electrical conductor having certain finite resistance, it can generate a heat at a rate given by I square R, or you can say V into uh, I into delta V type of thing. So that also may lead to evolution of heat. So there may be other reaction like nuclear reaction may be there, nuclear reaction may be there, because of that also it may evolve energy. So apart from energy crossing the boundaries of the system, there may be also internal evolution of energy or internal absorption of energy. And they are generally volumetric in nature. Whereas the heat that is crossing the boundaries, they cross across a certain area. And the heat, the evolution of heat that we are talking of, they may be because of throughout the volume. So this we call it as a volumetric heat generation. And they are magnitude is given by this G dot. G dot stands for the rate of energy generated per unit volume. This G dot, small g dot, indi it indicates the rate of internal heat generation per unit volume. So the rate of heat generated will be equal to G dot into delta x, delta y, delta z. Okay. But delta x, delta y, delta z is the volume. And if G dot is the rate of heat generation per unit volume, multiply that with the volume of the element given by delta X, delta Y, delta Z. So this is the rate of heat generation internal to the volume. So these are the energies that are involved in this volume, given by the rate of heat flow across the six bounding surfaces and the rate of internal volumetric heat generation given by the rate of volumetric heat generation per unit volume in multiplied by the volume of the element. Now, 
taking these things, what may happen that it may so happen that when you have this energy coming in, going out, generated energy, all this may mutually balance within itself. If that is the case, then there is no net accumulation of energy within the volume. But that is a very unusual case. In general, what we can expect is that when there are different energies that are crossing the boundary, some are incoming like Q dot Y, Q dot X, Q dot Z. Some are leaving like Q dot X plus delta X, Q dot at Y plus delta Y, Q dot at Z plus delta Z. They may be of different magnitude. And also this G dot into the volume of the element given by delta X, delta Y, delta Z. This also may be such a magnitude of such magnitude that they may not cancel each other. So what we can expect in general is that the net rate of energy that is entering plus the rate of energy that is generated within the volume, that may not be exactly equal to the rate of energy leaving the volume. If the incoming heat plus the generated heat is equal to the rate of outgoing heat, then we may expect there is no internal accumulation of energy. But if the rate of incoming heat plus the rate of generated heat, if the magnitude of these two together is more than the rate of going outgoing energy, then we can expect that there will be accumul progressive accumulation of energy. On the other hand, if the rate of incoming heat plus the rate of generated heat, if the magnitude of this is less than the rate of outgoing heat, then what will happen? If the incoming heat plus the generated heat, if the magnitude of these two together is less than the rate of outgoing heat, then the body will start losing its internal energy content, content with respect to time. So we can have situation where if the incoming heat and generated heat together is more than the outgoing heat, then there will be a continuous rise of energy of the volume. On the other hand, if the incoming heat plus the generated heat is less than the outgoing heat, then there will be a continuous fall of energy level of the volume. So, if we now take an account of the overall energies that are crossing the boundary, the energy which is generated, energy leaving the boundary, energy coming inside the boundary, all these things. Here, what we have done is that the entering heat is given by Q dot X, Q dot Y, Q dot Z. And there may be living energy living at phases X plus delta X, Y plus delta Y, Z plus delta Y, given by the energy living is energy out. So it will be negative. So it will be minus Q dot at X plus delta X, minus Q dot at Y plus delta Y, minus Q dot at Z plus delta Z. So this is a net energy entering through the different phases. The net energy entering is equal to energy entering minus the energy leaving. This apart, there may be a rate of generation of heat, capital G dot within the element. And as I have said, what is that magnitude of that capital G dot? That is equal to small g dot into the volume. Where, what is small g dot? Small g dot is the rate of energy per unit volume. Multiply that with the volume, it becomes equal to capital G dot, okay? So this capital G dot represents the rate of energy generation within the total volume given by delta X, delta Y, delta Z. Whereas small, this is equal to small g dot into the volume of the element given by delta X, delta Y, delta Z. Whereas the small g dot represents the rate of energy generation per unit volume of that cubical element. Now this thing on the left hand side indicates the total change of energy of the control volume because it is taking care of the incoming energy plus the generated energy minus the outgoing energy. Now this, if this is positive, then it will indicate a rise of energy of the control volume. If this part plus this part minus the outgoing part, if some total of this thing is negative, that means there is a net fall in energy of the control volume. Whether it is rise or fall, 
that will be given by the change of energy of the control volume and this may be positive if it is positive that means there will be a rise and if it is negative that means there is a fall of energy level of that element and the change of energy of the element is given by delta e and if the whole thing is happening over a period of time small period of time given by delta t then this indicates the rate of change of energy of the control volume and that is what we are considering the terms on the left hand side they indicate the rate of net rate of energy entering plus the rate of energy generated is given by the rate of change of energy of the element as given by delta e by this thing i will be taking some maybe some extra 5 minutes of time because we started late yes sir yes sir. now this change of energy of the element delta e element that is nothing but the energy at the end of this tenure that is given by energy level at a time t plus delta t and when you started what was the energy that is given by e at t so we are looking at a phenomenon in between an interval from t to t plus delta t the interval is given by delta t time and that interval starts at time t and ends at time t plus delta t and the e at t plus delta t indicates the energy at time t plus delta t and e suffix t indicates the energy of the element at the beginning of this observation given by et so this indicates the change of energy of the control volume that we indicate over here delta e of the element this is the energy at the end of this observation and this is the energy at the beginning of this observation that is e at time t plus delta t is the energy content of the volume at the end of this observation and e at t is the energy of the control volume at the beginning of the observation and what is the net change of energy in between the beginning and the end that is given by the difference of energy as i said it may be it may be positive quantity indicating that the energy is going up and when it will happen when the inflow of energy is more and when it will be negative that is the energy level will fall compared to the energy level at the beginning then it will be negative when that will happen if the incoming energy is less than the outgoing energy then the energy of the body will fall and we can say that this is equal to the mass of the control volume into specific heat of the control volume multiplied by the temperature at the end of this process of observation minus the temperature at the beginning of this observation so it is given by mass into specific into delta t of the element so specific is capacity that small c term you can write it small you can write it small because we normally write things in a lower case when we take the specific properties like volume a small v like enthalpy specific enthalpy in small h uh, so it will be better to write in small c letter there will be some reason for which they have written that will be a typo typographical thing because sometimes what happens you write small c it may get lost or it may appear like whether there is a suffix or something that's why they may have taken but you as a matter of practice i also follow that thing that you have said that to write it in small c it will be small m into small c into delta t of the element again this mass that we consider that you can break into the components like the density into the volume of the element this mass we can substitute by the density of that element multiplied by the volume of the element is given by delta x delta y into delta z into c into t at the end of the observation inter time interval minus t at the beginning of this time interval and that rate of energy generation capital g dot is given by the rate of volumetric heat generation g small g dot indicates the rate of this we call it as the rate of volumetric heat generation given by the rate of heat generation per unit volume the work this unit will be of small g the unit will be rate of heat generation that is watt per unit volume that is per meter cube the unit of small g dot is watt per meter cube multiply that with the meter cube that is the volume of the element you get the rate of heat generation over the entire uh, control volume 
there we get capital G dot equal to what? So we can write it as equal to G into G, small g dot into delta x delta y delta z which is the volume of that control volume that you are considering. And if we substitute all these things, then we can further we can further simplify. What we can do here is that if we substitute this part, it will be rho into c into delta x delta y delta z into delta t by time. Now, now, so it will be rho into c into volume into delta t by time. And if we assume that over that time, the rho into volume is mass that is not changing and specific it also is something that will be changing, but it will be changing essentially because of change of temperature. It is not a time dependent thing, but rather it is essentially a temperature dependent thing, but it may change with time because temperature may change with time. If you observe this thing, the specific heat, it may change, it may appear if you measure the specific at some point of time, if you measure the specific at some other point of time, you may see a you may see a difference of that thing. But that difference is not essentially because of change of time. That difference is because with time, your temperature may change, and as the temperature changes, specific heat may change. But it is not dependent, uh, not a function of time. So we can bring it out of all these things. The rho is constant with respect to time. C is constant with respect to time. Volume is constant with respect to time. You can write rho C into delta V into del T del time. So it becomes delta T is a temperature change by within the time interval. And for a small interval, when delta T approaches to zero, then we can write it as equal to del t capital T by del small t, that is a time. So rate of change of temperature with respect to time. Here, if you notice, here you have a volume. In this term also, you have a volume. The rate of heat generation also, you have a volumetric rate of heat generation given by rate of heat generation per unit volume into volume. So here also you have a volume, here also you have a volume, and there is a scope for cancellation of this volume so that the thing that we get is independent of the volume term because it how much amount of volume we take that is at our choice whereas the physical phenomenon that we are observing should not be choice dependent it should be in, independent of the choice of the volume that we take now here what will happen we can we can expand we can expand this term q dot at x plus delta x with the help of the Taylor series, so that we can write it as equal to this q dot at x plus x is equal to q dot at x plus del del x of q dot at x into delta x plus plus what plus the higher order terms. Similarly, you can expand through Taylor series. You can expand this through Taylor series, and they have followed a different approach. What they have done is that. They have, they have divided the whole thing by the volume. So if you divide this whole thing by the volume, what you can write, this is equal to q dot x minus q dot x plus delta x, or you can write it in a different way, minus of q dot x plus delta x minus qx by the volume that is given by delta x, delta y, delta j. So all these things, you can write it like that, dividing both sides by the volume, you get minus of q dot at x plus delta x minus q dot divided by delta x, delta y, delta z. Similarly, for the second term, that is minus of minus of q dot at y plus delta y minus q dot of y, because this minus and this minus makes it plus q dot y divided by delta y into delta x, delta y, delta z. Similarly, it is minus of q dot at z plus delta z minus q dot z divided by delta x, delta y, delta z. Then you have you have divided both sides by this volume. So volume part will cancel. What will be remaining there is small g dot. Here also the volume will cancel. So what will remain is rho into c into this part. T at temperature at T plus delta T time T plus delta T 
minus temperature at time t divided by delta t. Now, now what you can do is that <clears throat> if we take a very small contour volume such that your delta x is approaching to zero, delta y is approaching to zero, delta z is approaching to zero, and your time also is approaching to zero. Then we can write it as nothing but equal to del del x of qx. This will be del del y of qy. This term will be del del z of qz. And what is this part? 1 by delta y into delta z. What is that part? What is that part? You see, delta y by q y ta jete sotai to ha a x direction e je mane area ta hocche x is the surface area through which this q dot x is entering the surface area is given by delta x into delta z sorry is delta y into delta z okay. the surface area is equal to delta y into delta z through that the set is entering and similarly if you see this q dot y is entering through the surface area given by delta x and delta z similarly q dot z is entering through a surface area of delta x into delta y Now there are two possibilities that you can take off is this thing that this is given by as I said this is given by del del x of q dot x and that if you multiply uh, divide by this area then what you get the rate of heat entering through the surface area divided by the surface area what does it give it gives you the average heat flux entering through that surface the rate of heat entering through a surface divided by the surface area will give you the average heat flux entering through the surface and when you when you make delta y and delta z approaching to zero then that average value becomes the local value of that heat flux because when this is approaching to zero then the area becomes smaller and smaller then the average becomes equal to any value within that area that you consider. So this gives you essentially this thing divided by this thing gives you the local heat flux at x plus delta x minus heat flux at x. So this is the rate of change of heat flux with respect to x. So what you get is del del x of heat flux. Del del x of heat flux that now is given by we know that the heat flux in a particular direction is given by minus k into delta del x. So it becomes there is a minus over here, and there is a if we apply the Fourier's law of del del x of small q x. Essentially, this if you divide by this thing, if you divide this by this thing, and when this delta y and delta z and delta x all tending to zero, then it becomes small q x plus delta x minus small q divided by delta x. So it becomes del del x of small q x and that small q x is given by minus k into delta del x. Now there is a minus over here and inside the bracket you have a minus. So this two makes it a plus. It becomes del del x of k into delta del x. Similarly this term becomes equal to del del y of k into delta del y. This term becomes equal to del del z of k into delta del z. Now here there is an assumption that k is constant irrespective of the direction that is k along x, k along y and k along z. These are assumed to be the same irrespective of the direction. So here implicitly one thing has been assumed is that the material that we are considering is an isotropic substance where k is not changing with direction. Do you have any class after, uh, after your 230? Hello. Yes, sir. We have yes, class. Yes, yes, yes. Machine drawing class. Yes, sir. 
and uh, so you have to take your lunch in between or what do you do normally so in that case let us stop because you must have some time to have your lunch and then participate okay. yes sir so yes yes sir stop it over here and can you can you tell how many of you are present uh, it is how many let me make a quick roll call okay okay sir so, roll 50 just tell me very quickly roll 50 Absent. Fifty-one. Present, sir. Fifty-one. Fifty-two. Present, sir. Fifty-three. Present, sir. Fifty-four. Fifty-six. Shobik. Absent. 